Uh, welcome to STG 208, uh, AWS Transfer Family, the Future of Managed File Transfer. I'm Smitha Sriram, Product Manager for Transfer Family, and today I'm joined by Ross Boyer, who's Solutions Architect for the service as well. Um, here's a little rundown of today's agenda, right? I'll give you a brief overview of the service. Um, and uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about common use cases where we've seen customers use the service uh, today. Um, and then Russ will do a feature deep dive that supports those common use cases. Uh, you'll hear from a customer, Goldman Sachs, uh, about their use case with Transfer Family. And this one is a special one for me because two years ago at the event, I met uh, the customer uh, you know, you'll be hearing from Shashi at this at the at the session, and it was really interesting to talk about their managed file transfer needs, and we worked together to bring their use case to market. And finally, Ross will end the session with a demo highlighting some of the features that we launched this year. So, um, so a little bit about file transfers, right? If you are if you have a need where you need to move data, let's say files from an external source, whether that external source is a vendor, a supplier, or your customer, right? Um, and you operate in any of the use cases, such as you know you need to exchange files with a financial institution in a healthcare scenario, or you're part of a supply chain network, right? You need to talk to a manufacturer, a distributor, a logistics provider, or you're running IoT devices remotely and you need to monitor them for different um, insights, right? And all of this requires file transfers and you need to do this either on a recurring or a frequent basis, ad hoc basis. You're probably running some type of file transfer software today to achieve that. And what we've heard from customers is managed file transfer workflows are complex, right? And hard to manage and to run in a scalable way. Right. And going on some of the challenges in running an infrastructure that supports these operations, right? You got to keep it on 24 seven, which means monitoring it for ups, uh, you know, for scaling, for availability, for uh, operational health. And you're going to make sure the infrastructure that supports these file transfers uh, are ready, are scaling as you grow your business in terms of connectivity needs, storage needs, compute needs, and also a, your third-party partner configuration, right? Um, a lot of times the data that's exchanged as part of this network is that inaccessible to your data science teams, right? It's locked up in a file share somewhere on-prem. And, you know, if you are a customer who's operating in a regulatory industry, right, with regulatory needs, um, that regular patching, auditing, you know, takes time away from your resources, right? Um, your resources who probably you want to channel towards, um, you know, your more core business needs. And that's the reason we launched AWS Tra Transfer Family at reInvent 2018. Um, the idea here is to give you a way uh, for frictionless file transfers uh, so that you can achieve the needs of your business-to-business -business connectivity uh, workflows. Highlighting some of the, quickly highlighting some of the benefits of the service. Uh, one is we have features that support seamless migration, right? So you might already have a network that you're uh, interacting with from your on-prem software and you want to bring that to the cloud. Uh, we make that easy so nothing changes for your third parties as you migrate, right? Um, the service is fully managed HA, highly available and available across the globe in uh, AWS regions across the world. Um, security and compliance are important tenets of the service, right? And the service natively integrates with other AWS services, such as you know, starting with your storage for S3 and EFS, for authentication, for networking, et cetera. Um, it is cost effective at 30 cents an hour and four cents a gigabyte for uploads and downloads. And it's simple to use, integrates you know, with your CI CD tools. And you know, you, whether you're setting it up for a quick try on the console to actually integrating it with your pipelines end to end. So how does it work, right? How, how do you migrate? Let's say today 
you are, you know, you have all of this running in your corporate data center. Right. The idea being with this service is you no longer need to run that infrastructure. And now all of that now points to what you run using AWS Transfer Family. The data lands in S3 or EFS, and it's available to run with your data lake in AWS, whether you want to use it for machine learning, analytics, uh, you know, uh, you know, databases, any of that. The data is now available for you to run and get insights. The key part of it, another key part of it is there is no change to any existing workflows on the left. If you saw those users, they remain the same. So those integrations that you have with them aren't disrupted while you benefit not needing to manage any infrastructure and having that data available for analysis in AWS. Um, your examples of transfer family customers, thank you, um, and how they've migrated and benefited from the service. Um, I want to go over a, an example that, um, you know, a little bit more into um, Liberty Mutual uh, Insurance. Liberty Mutual Insurance is one of the largest property and casualty insurers in the world, right? And as they were planning their migration to the cloud, um, they had a need to exchange files with their regulatory providers, right? And those and file transfer was one of the infrastructure that they had to move to the cloud, right? And they talk about, they, so they have a blog post, if you go to our website, there's a blog post uh, by them where they talk about how the transfer family service made it easy for them to migrate, right? And eliminated that heavy lifting of managing any infrastructure so that they could gain advantage from, you know, from a smaller operational footprint, right? While having that data easily available to their data scientists within Liberty Mutual. Um, similarly, I would like to talk about another example. In this case, T-Systems is a system integrator, right? Um, a consultancy service in Europe. And they helped a customer, Deutsche Telekom, migrate their file transfer applications, right? Um, that were using SFTP as the file transfer protocol. And again, here, if you see thematically the SI T systems help them uh, move all that their file transfer services to AWS using AWS transfer family so that again, their factory team would spend less time on data migration and, you know, operational aspects of managing file transfers. And they actually spend time more on application building within AWS and those applications that were more core to their business. A quick rundown about, you know, how we've iterated over the service uh, over the last 18 months, right? Adding new protocols, uh, FTPS and FTP, storage services, EFS. Um, this year, I've been proud of two major launches that Russ is going to talk more about in this feature deep dive and do a demo uh, to illustrate some of the use cases that you can use in your environment, notably managed AD integration, which means you can integrate with your Microsoft AD, whether it's self-managed um, in your on-prem or in cloud or AWS directory services managed AD easily uh, without having to run any custom code. The other one uh, was in, sep in September during storage day, we launched low-code automation workflows for file post-processing so that when a file lands in AWS, it makes it easy for you to pre-process that file using common methods, uh, you know, such as scanning, encryption, uh, you know, compression, and then move that, feed that data into your data pipelines for further analysis. The service is available in 20 commercial AWS regions, China and GovCloud, and for a full uh, set of services and scope for compliance, uh, visit our website so you can see some of the key compliance competencies like PCI, HIPAA, and SOC. Okay, cool. Now, let me talk a little bit about some of the common use cases that we've seen with our customers over file transfers. The, the one use case that's really popular is exchanging files right, with institutions, whether it's for financial or healthcare needs, right? Um, and the key part of this is these transactions need to be securely tra transferred, right? The, um, so that means data security and encryption options are important, right? Many times customers don't want to change anything about how they're interacting with these institutions. So no changes, let's say, to endpoint configurations, credentials. The other aspect is making sure 
the endpoint is compatible with legacy systems, right? A lot of these institutions have uh, set operating systems and clients already in place, and you want the workflow to work as is. Finally, uh, and most importantly, the compliance regulations, whether PCI for you know, financial transactions or HIPAA eligible for healthcare, those are two important compliance needs that we've heard for this use case. The other use cases are business application integrations, right? Um, a lot of times you, you're running business applications, whether these are your CRM platform, your ERP systems, your transportation management systems, or any of your specialty applications running on-prem, you want to be able to connect those applications with uh, your data lake in S3. Right. And key part of that is easy connectivity options, right? So that you can support it with a variety of applications. An example being either Cooper or uh, you know, or, or SAP or Salesforce, right? And you want to be able to control how input from these applications are fed to your downstream applications, whether it's message queuing, throttling. So you have a controlled way to get the data from these applications into your S3 bucket for your data lake. And you want to be able to build modern architectures using event-driven um, mechanisms so that you can automate the whole pipeline end-to-end -end and whether you may have a dashboard for your data scientists to view and analyze the data. The other use case that we hear about are supply chain right? use cases, whether it's secure business-to-business -business connectivity, or you want to be able to source data across dis different sources that have different, different interfaces right? And then also get data from your system of record application and bring it into AWS for, you know, analysis or integrate it with other applications that you're running in AWS. Finally, content distribution platforms, right? You might be a provider of value-added data sets, right? And you want to make that data available. You want to, uh, you want to, first thing, you may already be running a content distribution platform on-prem and you want to be able to easily migrate that. You want to you reach out to as many subscribers as possible. And, you know, for that reason, you may want to have multiple protocol options, right? So depending on how they want to consume the data, you have that option readily available. And most importantly, you want to be able to apply fine grain access controls, right? So that you selectively share data, right? And that's your revenue protection. This data is what you uh, produce. So you want to be able to pr protect the revenue and, sh you know, selectively share what data your users are subscribed to. Um, with that, I'll pass it on to Russ, and he's going to go into features that support each of these use cases, right, uh, so that you can run uh, Transfer Family in your environment in AWS. Thanks, Smitha. I'm Russ Boyer. I'm a solution architect working with the product management team for Transfer Family. I'm going to walk you through a feature deep dive. Before we go deep on the features, let's talk about the different areas in which we're iterating and delivering those features. So we're always looking to add additional protocols, and this year we brought to market a web client. We'll be talking more about that in a moment. Additionally, we are always looking to enhance our authentication story, and you know we need ways of regulating who accesses what files. We need the ability to authenticate your users, and we'll talk more about how we have iterated there as well. Additionally, automation is important to our customers. You need the ability to process these files and not just upload them. So we're gonna talk more about our workflows feature that we've added to Transfer Family, and in addition, we're gonna talk about a, an architecture that lets you connect to external providers and pull files in. Uh, for transfers from those external providers. And then we also all, always are looking to add to our security story. So we've had several new developments on ways that you can secure your endpoints and also ways that you can secure your data using the workflows we discussed before. So let me take a moment and we'll go deep on each of these features. When you're setting up managed file transfer with AWS Transfer Family, you always need to start with the concept of least privilege for each user. 
And the way that you do that with transfer family is you envision for each end user a namespace. That namespace should only contain the files and folders that that user should have access to and nothing else. We've had logical directories for years with transfer family, and we're gonna talk more about how logical directories can help you build that namespace for each end user. Additionally, we're gonna get into some deep concepts like how to use S3 access points, which is a new feature for us, and also how to use POSIX controls in the EFS, which is also a new feature for this year. So at a top level, a logical directory is a mapping. It is constituted from two elements. You have an entry point, which is the path you want the end user to see for the file or folder, and you have a target. The target is the true path to the file or folder that you're mapping to. Transfer family gives you the ability to specify a number of these mappings per user so that you can set up various folders for that end user to allow for that access. That being said, sometimes our customers need to be able to do asymmetrical access. And what we mean by asymmetrical access is set up some files and folders to be read-write and some files and folders to be read-only. You can definitely do that with IAM roles and policies, but it can get really complex on scale, especially if you have really unusual naming conventions in your buckets. So this year, we've launched the ability to use AWS transfer family with S3 access points. An S3 access point gives us a way of applying an alternative policy to a bucket. And by using an S3 access point and a logical directory mapping that does something such as blocking put for S3, you're able to get read-only access without having to do a lot of complex IAM roles and policies. S3 access points really enhance our story around building the namespace for each end user. It gives you the ability to really just use logical directory mappings uh, directly down the bucket path for things like read write and then use logical directory mappings down that access point path for read only type access it's a great blog post that you can go check out that'll walk you through in detail how to use s3 access points with aws transfer family so per file access controls is exactly where efs shines as a storage solution by combining the logical directory concepts we talked about on the previous slides with POSIX controls in the file system, we're able to create each user a POSIX profile where we can specify a unique UID or user ID, a unique group ID that maybe could be shared across an entire group of users. And we can set up individual fine-grained access controls on each file inside of a folder. Or we can set up group controls to files and folders using the GID. We can control all of that from transfer family. Transfer family allows you to establish root level users as well, where you can actually go in and set up the various uh, file system, file level accesses that we've described here. So EFS is a really critical part of any managed file transfer infrastructure you're trying to build where you need to be able to control access per file. And that includes files and folders that are in the exact same file and folder directory. So with S3 controls, you get into uh, the ability to control things at a folder level and doing things per file can be difficult. When you need to control access per file, definitely consider EFS as your storage solution. And, you know, another piece of this story comes down to customers always want new ways to allow their end users to access their data. So we, we brought to market for you this year a web client. This web client is open source. It was built by our solution architect community. But it's available for your end users to be able to access their data over the web and not just through the regular protocols that we support directly. 
transfer family logical directories will still be respected with the open source client. That means that you can establish your views or your namespaces per user, and those users can log in over any of the protocols that we support to access their data and see their files and folders, or they can log in via the web client over a simple web GUI and see the same files and folders in a limited namespace view that they would see over our regular protocols. All of this is securely done over HTTPS with SFTP on the back end. Just another way we're trying to expand on our protocols for your end users to access your data. And speaking of authenticating, we did add Microsoft Active Directory as an identity provider this year. Actually, we added two solutions in the AWS Directory Services portfolio. We are able to integrate with Managed AD as well as AD Connector. Managed AD is an API level integration that we are able to support right from inside of our console. I'll have uh, more details on that in the demo later. Additionally, you can set up AD Connector for an easy way to tie back to your on-premises or self-managed domain controllers as well. And also in the authentication space, we have been iterating on our third-party identi identity provider. That includes no longer requiring our API gateway. We can now call a Lambda function directly from our service to authenticate your users. This means we can support a very broad variety of identity providers downstream. The Lambda function could query anything from Okta or Secrets Manager or even a database for a completely self-delivered authentication schema. Once you've uploaded your files, you need to be able to process those files and do things with them. This has been a very common request from you as our customers. We brought our low-code workflows feature uh, out in September. This allows you to specify a number of steps that can be executed to process your data as it comes in. And we are logging that all centrally back to CloudWatch under Transfer Family. I'll be giving a, a deep dive on these workflows in the demo later. But workflows allow you to create things uh, like custom lambdas that can do advanced file processing. Things like decrypting a PGP encrypted file on ingest or doing a malware scan of that file as it comes in. Additionally, our workflow engine allows you to specify some exception steps to take in the event there's an exception in your custom Lambda processing. So for things like that malware scan, you're able to specify alternative steps that can happen, for example, when a malware scan might be positive. Another area you've asked for us to deliver new features in is the ability to monitor your transfer family servers. We have added some statistics to our console directly inside of our console page. You can now, from within the transfer family console, see what your server is doing the number of files that are coming through, the amount of data that's coming through. We've also enhanced our CloudWatch logging. So our CloudWatch logs include more detail to help you with your auditing and compliance. We'll take a look at CloudWatch as part of our demo as well. The last architecture we're gonna talk about in this section is our outbound connector architecture. This is important for customers who need to be able to reach out into external providers of managed file transfer. Perhaps they want to pull a file in uh, and put it into S3 so that they can then serve that same file back out to their own end users from their managed file transfer, or they may want to push a file out. We did bring a reference architecture out in our blog channel. It is deployable with a CloudFormation template and it will allow you to do exactly that. This link will take you to the post and walk you through how to deploy this architecture in your own environment. Now I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Richard Barclay, one of our solution architects, who's gonna introduce you to the Goldman Sachs team so that you can hear from them about their experience building out managed file transfer 
on the transfer family. Hello, everybody at reInvent. Today, we're coming to you from sunny Singapore, and we're really excited to have James and Sashi both here with us from Goldman Sachs. They're both executive directors of technology, and they've been working very closely with us on building out a managed file transfer service. Uh, James, Goldman Sachs is a really well-respected financial services firm. Can you tell me a little bit more about your role at the bank and, and what you've been doing on the project? Sure, so um, I, I look after two uh, tech teams there. Uh, so first of all, I look after the, uh, the grid compute technology team. So that's the, the grid compute that's used for a lot of the risk and pricing throughout the bank, um, using quite a lot of uh, cloud technology in there as well. Um, so also I look after the, uh, the MFT team. So we have a, our own internal uh, MFT solution called SFX, um, and that's basically the file transfer solution. Sasha. I'm cloud enablement team lead. Um, the cloud enablement team is responsible to bring in or enable public cloud technologies within the firm using industry best practices um, in an agile fashion. Um, my other role is to work with business, different business departments, advise them on cloud migration, um, cloud design, like one of the team I'm working with is uh, SFX with James. Okay. Yeah, great. And, and Sashi, could you just tell us a little bit more about the importance of cloud at Goldman Sachs? Sure. Um, so I think this question has been answered by our leadership, like in, in many um, public forums, like reInvent and uh, Investors Forum. Like, I'll, I'll summarize quickly for you, right? Um, so really two things. One is accelerate the innovation, right? And second is delightful developer experience, right? Like, you know, make your developer more productive using bleeding edge, cutting edge technologies within the firm. And accelerate the innovation. What you really want to do is become a vertical bank right, using cloud technologies, do all the heavy lifting for our client, provide differentiated service, um, and, and, and digital platform, which basically meets all the regulatory and, 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 and compliance requirements. Okay, thanks, thanks Ashley. And, and James, could you just tell me a little bit more about the importance of managed file transfer for Goldman Sachs? Yeah, of course. So um, if you think about it, data is really the, the lifeblood of a bank. Um, you know, we are nothing. We can't operate without data being interchanged between you know, us and our regulators, us and our vendors and our clients. So we need to do that like reliably every single day. Um, so it's absolutely critical for our operation. Yeah, got it. No, thank, thanks, James. And like when I think of managed file transfer and I think of the financial services industry, obviously you guys are heavily regulated. Mm -hmm. uh, you're working with trading partners. Um, you've got a number of uh, other partners that you have to interoperate with and exchange data with. Can, can you, James, give us a, an idea of the size and the scale of what you have to deal with on a daily basis? Sure. So <clears throat> if you look at how many people that we, we uh, people and organizations that we have to interact with. This is like means that we literally have to transfer millions of files every single day. Um, so we're delivering files to people, we're, we're collecting files from people, we're making files available to people. You know, and, and this all has to be done, um, like, like I say, very reliably. Um, and we have to, to manage this very sort of bursty nature of, of this, uh, this, this delivery, you know, because people need to access files at the right time. They need files delivered at the right time. Yeah, no, so, so the timeliness is incredibly important, I'm sure. And J James, like, again, like, you know, Goldman Sachs is, as I mentioned before, you know, it's regulated. You, you guys have a lot of constraints on you. And also, um, you've got a technology plant that's been in place for a long time, and I'm sure you've got constraints on how you integrate, et cetera, et cetera. Could you just sort of explain maybe some of the complexities and some of the things that you, you've had to deal with to actually implement a new managed file sure. transfer service. Yeah. So if, if you think about like FTP, SFTP as a protocol, the pretty old protocols, right? So you know, why is this even a hard problem? It, it's a hard problem because there are so many different implementations of, of 
these protocols. Um, there are so many different remote system behaviors that we have to, to interact with. And we don't necessarily have any control over the, <clears throat> those, those implementations. So the problem is in the number of edge cases that we, we have to work around. You know, we have, have, have to provide a solution for our clients to, do, to interact with these highly heterogeneous systems. Right, got it. And, and Sashi, just coming to you, like any other features or key requirements you need to meet? Um, I would pick up from where James like left. Like, so as James highlighted, like, you know, the scalability, um, availability, mm. resiliency requirement, right? To be, to be, to make a, to have a highly available file transfer solution, right? The other bit, which I would mention is, think about like, you know, you're gonna be sending file to your clients or regulators or receiving file and sending within the firm, right? How do you ensure that, you know, the file is scanned, right? Mm. File is safe to be distributed mm. around, right? So um, definitely that I would count as a um, critical feature. And, and, and James, could you sort of maybe explain to the audience at reInvent some of the complexities and challenges that you've had in implementing a managed file transfer service? So, I mean, going back to the, the heterogeneous um, nature of what we're dealing with, you know, the, 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 there is so much complexity in that. And the, that combined with the, the number of, of clients that we have to deal with, the number of internal business units that we have, have to deal with, it's all compounds the complexity. But all of this has to meet SLAs, right? People want files delivered on time. If they send us a file that needs to be delivered to a regulator within X amount of minutes, that needs to, to go there on time. And they need, they need to be confident that that can happen. So what sounds like a very simple service yes. is actually quite complex, especially when you're dealing with the kind of scale that Goldman Sachs yes. deals with. Underneath this quite simple mm. concept, this an ocean of edge cases mm. and and spikes in demand, this bursty mm. nature that I was, I was talking about, that really, really does add to the complexity of the solution. Right. And, and Sashi, just coming to you, could, could you sort of explain like why Goldman Sachs didn't choose to carry on building their own service? Why did they choose to partner with us at AWS on, on building out a managed file transfer service? Yeah, I would like think about it, right? What we are trying to achieve, like with all the scale and complexity aside, right? We are trying to send a file and receive a file. Mm. And it's an old protocol, right? Mm. Like why it is just not a commodity, right? Why we can't just, it's there, like, and then we can deliver file and receive file, right? Why do we need to maintain such a large piece of infrastructure code and deal with all these complexities? And, and we got like, you know, a question asked from our leadership, like, you know, why it is not a black box, right? And, and, and that's when like, you know, we, we started thinking about what to do. And precisely two years ago, I was in reInvent and I was discussing with your AWS transfer mm -hmm. service about like, you know, this is something we are thinking. And uh, I think AWS transfer service recognized the uh, industry-wide applicability and they approached us that we can collaborate and, and we shared our, our IP, like, mm -hmm. you know, what, what we have, learned over the years and, and and we are looking forward to like, you know, what, what comes out of this. Yeah, no, it's been a great partnership working with you guys. Like, you know, we've had the AWS transfer family team, we've had ProServe, we've had Amazon managed services all coming coming together and working very closely with Goldman Sachs to, to meet your requirements and, and, and it's, it's been fun. And um, James, I, I just want to come on to something which is more to do with the heart of the solution and really talk about like, you know, at the heart you've got SFTP and you've got S3. And, and we mentioned a little bit earlier about workflows. Can you, can you kind of zoom in and sort of talk about the features and what you see as the things that, that really act as a bit of a game changer for you? So for me, the important part here is, you know, the ability to have these workflows, um, like you mentioned. Um, so having workflows as part of this sort of um, file transfer workflow, it really gives uh, the users a lot of power in terms of the routing and mm -hmm. what happens to their file in transit. You know, and, and that kind of really makes this a platform for innovation, if, if, if you look at it that way. Yeah. Well, he used the right word, like platform of innovation, right? Like, and I'll expand on that, how it is platform of, uh, for, for innovation, right? Think about it, right? You receive the file. And you still need, like, people need to process that file, right? Mm -hmm. And you have all those sorts of data pipeline, like, you know, data analytics, building, rolling out your best book solution. Now, having that in the cloud and delivering that to an AWS S3 bucket, 
really opens the door for us, right? Like you can build all your data pipeline, data analytics, AI, ML, what sort, what not. And, and, and it also further our cloud uh, strategy. Mm. Yeah, no, no thanks. No, I really want to thank you both today for your time and sharing your story with everybody on stage at reInvent. And, and just to sort of summarize, like Goldman Sachs have been very pivotal in helping and inputting into the development uh, for the AWS transfer family. And uh, I'm sure the guys on stage will talk to you more about some of the future capabilities that are, that are now being released. And I just want to thank James and Sashi again. Really fantastic. Thanks, Richard and the team at Goldman for telling us all about your journey with managed file transfer on the AWS transfer family service. Now we're going to get into our demo. Just wanted to take a moment to cover at a high level the steps of the demo that I'm about to do. First, I'm going to create a workflow and assign it to a transfer family server to process files that are uploaded. I'm going to log in as a couple of users. Those users will be authenticated by Microsoft Managed Active Directory. I'm going to upload a file that's going to be processed by our workflow. This file is going to have some PII removed as a part of that workflow operation. And it's going to stage that file out for another user who represents a subscriber to pull it down. So let's step into our demo and check that out. To start our demo, I'm going to go into the AWS Transfer Family console page. When we go into the console page, we'll see that there's now a workflow section of the Transfer Family console. We'll go ahead and go there and we're going to create a workflow. Let's name our workflow reInvent Workflow. Then we'll need to specify the steps that we want to use as we process each file that's uploaded to our transfer family server. So let's add a step. We'll go ahead and add a copy step. We'll name that reInvent copy. And the files are going to be coming in in our demo to, to bucket one. Let's go ahead and copy them to bucket two. And we're going to put a prefix of archive there. We'll go ahead and check this box. This way, if we get a file that we already have, we'll overwrite it with the new file. Next, in create step, let's add another step. In this step, we're going to tag the file. This is a simple way of differentiating files that come in through your managed file transfer workflow with transfer family. We'll name this reInvent tag. We'll go ahead and say the key is source, and the value is MFT for Managed File Transfer. Select Next and Create Step. And let's add one last step here. We're going to do a custom Lambda function. I pre-created a Lambda function that's going to do some additional processing to files as they come in. I'm going to name this step reInvent Lambda. I'm going to go ahead and choose my pre-created function. I'm going to bump this timeout value up to 300 for five minutes. And we'll go ahead and select Create Step here. And now we've got all of our steps created. I want to talk about this section, Exception Handlers. Exception Handlers are an alternate set of steps that can be executed, for example, when you're using a custom Lambda. Let's say you had logic in your custom Lambda that could trigger an exception based on certain issues, such as a failure. You can then have these alternate steps that can be executed for that particular execution of your workflow. This is a great way to build things like a malware scanner in this custom Lambda. It could throw an exception when it found that a file was positive for malware. And then your exception handler could kick in and perhaps move the file to another bucket, send out a notification, things like that. We're not going to use exception handlers in today's demo. Let's go ahead and create this workflow. And now that our workflow is created, we need to assign it to our transfer family server. If we go into the console page for our transfer family server, we can scroll down and we'll see this additional details section. In this additional details section, you'll see this post upload processing. This is where we assign our workflow. Let's edit and go to our workflow section and select the workflow we just created. 
Another important note when you're assigning a workflow to a transfer family server is it needs a role for execution from IAM. This role needs to have access to all of the services that your workflow needs access to. So for example, we need S3 access to do things like copying data or tagging data, and we need the ability to call that Lambda function as well. I pre-created a role here. We'll go ahead and select that and we'll save. Now we've assigned our workflow to our transfer family server. I did want to point out one more thing while we're in the transfer family console. You'll notice that I have specified a couple of managed AD groups here for access. So for example, this group represents our publishers. They're the ones that are going to be uploading data and we're having them land in bucket one and go into a home directory based on their username. We are restricting those users into their home directory, which means they're effectively trooted by transfer family into that directory, can't get elevated out of it. I specified a similar access pattern to bucket two for another group that represents our subscribers. Let's go ahead and log in as a publisher and a subscriber and let's upload a file for workflow processing. So now I've authenticated to my transfer family server using managed active directory on the back end. Do the same thing for a subscriber user. I go ahead and do an LS on both sides just to show that there's no files here. So now as our publishing user, I want to go ahead and upload a file. Let's go look and see what's happening in the console. Let's go to bucket one and refresh our view. What we'll see is that Transfer Family uploaded this file that we just uploaded as MFT Publish and went ahead and put it in an MFT Publish home directory or prefix. And here's the file that we just uploaded. So this file was uploaded. Now it's going to be processed by our workflow. Let's go take a look and see what that looks like on the subscriber side. Let's see if our process is done. Our process is still running, so let's actually go back to the console and, and check out a couple of other things. Let's go to bucket two and let's take a look at this archive directory in bucket two. If we go into the archive folder, we'll see here is our same file. You can see that the modif modify time and all is identical to the object that we uploaded as our published user. So now we've got a preserved copy here in Archive, and that means that even if the original user that uploaded the file decided to delete it, if we needed to save this file out for regulatory purposes, perhaps even selectively apply a lifecycle to it based on the tag that we applied during our workflow processing, which we see here, source of MFT, we could theoretically apply a selective lifecycle policy based on that tag to say move this file out to Glacier and, and even keep this file forever. So let's go back to our subscribe user and see what's going on. So now we'll see that we have our file. I want to go ahead and do a long listing. And you can see that the file that we have in our subscriber directory is actually a little bit smaller than the file that we publish. So let's actually log out and take a look at both of these files. So if you look at the file on the left that the publisher uploaded, You'll note that it has last name, first name, and it's got a couple of sensitive fields like social security number 
and the street level address in addition to city, state, and zip. So let's look at the same file from the subscriber's point of view. On the subscriber side, you'll see that we have removed the social security number as well as the street level address. We now only have first name, last name, city, state, and zip. The subscriber represents a less privileged user in the sense of data security. And what we've done with our workflow is we've actually loaded our file into an Athena table and we've performed a query that removed the PII from the file. Then we staged it out as a new CSV file that is appropriate for the subscriber's level of access. Let's return to the console and let's take a look at one more thing, which is our CloudWatch logs. If we look at our CloudWatch logs under our logging group for our transfer family server, we will see that our log group contains all of the information about everything that was happening on the transfer family side. So we see our subscriber interacting with our transfer family server. We see our publisher interacting with our transfer family server. We see our workflow executing all in one place in our CloudWatch logging. So that concludes the demo. We'll return to our presentation. So hopefully you enjoyed our recorded demo. Uh, we want to share a few additional resources for you if you want to learn more about what you saw today in Transfer Family as a Service. We have our website where you can find all, all sorts of useful tools like our videos. Of course, we have our user guide and documentation. We have some excellent customer references that you can check out where our customers have shared blog posts that will walk you through how they adopted AWS Transfer Family for their own managed file transfer uses. And we appreciate you attending our session.